You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. On this tree that I have up here, I have pinned some of my favorite Christmas memories. I took the opportunity this week to walk down memory lane through my photos and look at stories of Christmases past. And some of these, I'm looking at them and I have huge smiles, beautiful smiles, in fact. Uh, In fact, that picture right there, which you can probably not see uh, with the big wreath, is Katie and I's first uh, Christmas together. Uh, Later on, there's a, a picture of us down here. There's pictures of my grandmother who redid her house for Christmas every year with like seven Christmas trees. It was just a beautiful, everything looked like 1940, 1950, nostalgic Christmas. There's a picture of me sitting with my grandmother and my great-grandmother where I would always find myself on Christmas Day for a meal and, and so on. And as I look at these pictures, I'm reminded of what I think were simpler times, happier times. I think, man, if Christmas could just be like that again. But this week as I began to look at each of those pictures, I started to remember life wasn't necessarily any better or happier then though there is something in our memory that seems to whitewash what we remember, and it it makes things seem better in the past. The truth is, I was in the middle of some really hard times that Christmas, just like I am this. Pastor and evangelist Nikki Gumbel, the founder of the Alpha, writes, there's something magical about Christmas, but the reality is it's almost not as perfect as we imagine. I love that line. As I look back and I remember a lot of these Christmases, I realize in many ways they're not as perfect as I imagined them to be. And I shouldn't be surprised that this Christmas is not as perfect as I wish it was. In fact, this morning, as we continue our spiritual pilgrimage together on Sunday mornings, a a spiritual pilgrimage, one of the greatest stories ever told, uh, we see a story that continues, as I said, to transform the world around us in a silver and gold. Our homes become all things bright. At this time of the year, it's like we believe once again that the whole world might even believe that Christmas can save us. It's amazing to think that one of the most humble and most normal everyday moments of poor birth has rewritten the story of the world around us. As I said two weeks ago, it's this time of the year that the early church gave the name Advent to, this annual pilgrimage into the nativity, into the story of Jesus' birth. And Advent means the coming in Latin of someone or something, a notable person or thing. And as followers of Jesus in Advent, we take a spiritual pilgrimage into the first Christmas story, a dry and dusty barnyard scene. It's that journey that we remember and celebrate the fulfillment of God's promises, the adventure in which Jesus' birth gives us as followers of Jesus hope and peace and love and joy. And we look back to remember what Jesus has promised yet to give. In the Christmas story, that we, it's a time we remember that God chooses to work through humble people in humble places in tough times. In the Christmas story, we remember that God chooses to work through not the powerful, not the critically acclaimed, not the accomplished, not those who have acquired much, but those who are just willing to live simply, faithfully. In the Christmas story, we remember that God has not forsaken humanity in its troubles. This was a time in history where they really felt like God had abandoned them. It had been generations since they had a prophet or had some sort of uh, divine leading from God, and they had begun to feel like mankind was abandoned by God. 
And God had become quiet. But it's into that story that we see God break through into the troubles of humanity and speak. The Christmas story opens with an older couple, as we looked at, who is invited into a younger person's adventure. It follows two younger couples. We looked at Mary last week and and Joseph today, two younger individuals who are invited to step out in faith in a way that will create tension in every part of their life. The story also invites uh, societal rejects, as we'll see next week, the shepherds to know and carry the transformative message of God. From this story, faith invites us onto this adventure to personally discover the eternal promises of hope, peace, joy, and love that emerge in this story. Think about it. These four themes have continued to shape the narrative, the songs, the spirit of the Christmas holiday season. In these four passages, there's one thing that ties them all together, and it's what we've been looking at for the past few weeks. This messenger who shows up and says, do not fear. Do not be afraid. And, and this is, as I've described it, our spiritual pilgrimage between, behind all that is merry and bright and into the real Advent story. This morning we are going to continue our Advent story by looking at the story of Joseph. And in each of these stories that we're reading, I'm reminded of Paul's writing to the church in Galatia who was in the middle of their own struggles. And he tells them in Galatians 6, 9 through 10, let us not become weary of doing good for the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In each of these stories, though they are facing great discouragement and struggle, God shows up and asks them to step out in greater faith to do even more. Not because he's asking them uh, to step out in a way that's going to make them feel bad about themselves or because he's mean and just wants to be uh, mean to them or oppress them in some way, because he wants them to develop greater trust in him, greater intimacy, more power. And Paul wants the same for his church. As we read the Christmas story, I hope that whatever we're walking through and we're carrying right now, we have this reminder that we must not become weary for doing good, that for the proper time, we too will experience an understanding of what God is up to in this season. This morning, as we continue, we're going to be looking at Matthew 1, 18 through 25. If you have your Bibles with me, with you, I invite you to follow along with me. And we're going to be looking at the way that God asks of Jacob. The first week, we saw how God asked of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the way that he asked them to step out in faith but gave them a greater sense of hope. Last week, Kevin looked at how God asked Mary to step out in faith despite her way her hopes and dreams will be lost or shattered, and she's still able to find peace in God's plans. This morning, as we continue the greatest story ever told, God will ask Joseph to step out in faith And even though the future remains unknown for him, he discovers a sense of joy that I believe sustains him. I invite you to follow along from Matthew 1, 18 through 25, as I read from it out of the New International Version. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her in public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home to be his wife. But he not, did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Many of us have been in a church for a long time. 
We've heard this story. We've read this story. We've grown familiar with this story. And as a result, we begin to lose a sense of the wonder, the mystery, the miraculousness of this story, the uniqueness of it. There are tons of stories in our scriptures of God bringing new life, even new birth and babies to couples. There are stories in Greek history from the same time of the gods bringing about uh, life and birth for other couples. But in no historical document or elsewhere in the scriptures do we get a story in which God consummates the birth of an individual. Theologian Craig Keener, who looks into the claims of many other historic religions, says the ancient biographies sometimes praised the miraculous births of their subjects. They would talk about bright lights in the room or something like that. But nowhere else in the Old Testament or Jewish tradition do we find the capacity of God in this way. Out of the stories in which there are miraculous births, there are no virgin births. There's no miraculous birth stories. In the ancient world, including all Jewish accounts, and there's a lot in the book of Enoch, uh, they're heavily embroidered with this sense of imagery that God is doing something wonderful. He's bringing about a baby. He fills a house with light. But nowhere does it shoot straight in narrative, and nowhere is God the one who consummates the marriage. This is something unique historically, physically, spiritually unmatched. This is uh, something so new that not only would it have been just unnerving for Joseph because, hey, now I have to figure out what I'm going to do in light of this, but unnerving because God has never seemingly acted this way before. Not only has God never acted this way before, seemingly no other religion has ever had a God that they believe acts in this way. When God does something new, a lot of times it can be unnerving. John Wimber in the vineyard used to say, when God wants to get through to us, often he will offend our minds to reveal what's in our hearts. Sometimes our minds are needed to be offended so that we can see what God is truly up to. He often works outside of what we see as reality. God is doing something unnervingly new. I'm sure Joseph thought, man, the scriptures didn't prepare me for this. And new is always uneasy and unnerving for individuals, for churches, for businesses. And if we don't have a deeper foundation or a glue that's going to hold us on, we too will become unglued. This week I did some reading on a story of Harriet uh, Tubman. If you don't know Harriet Tubman, she was one of the most notorious freed slaves or escaped slaves who went back to help Free others. I think they estimate that she helped over 300 slaves find their freedom in her day. Harriet was called the Moses of her people. That's what they referred to her as. When she was younger, she endured a traumatic experience. A a slave was trying to get away, and her slave master tried to stop them by throwing a two-pound weight at them, but they missed and hit her instead. It actually pushed her skull in and created physical and neurological damage. She had epilepsy and some other problems as a result from that. But something that happened as a result of that is she also began to experience visions and dreams. She considered them to be signs from God, signs in which he was speaking to her. She could have looked at that as man. I've really been injustice in life. I've been damaged. I've been hurt. But instead, she saw it as a sign of her freedom. Now, science has tried to say it was a form of epilepsy, a front lobal epilepsy that she's had. But her dreams were of meeting people, of freeing slaves, things that came true. These sound like that God used her in mightily ways to enact his will. Joseph, in this story, is given the same choice. He's now facing a decision he must make in response, and he can choose to shut down and say, man, nothing is good with this, nothing good came out of it, or he can choose to find a greater sense of why, a greater joy and come out of it. And I think in this story, despite the cost of himself, Joseph models honor. So often when we are in tough situations, 
when life seems to be coming on glued around us, we just give up. We shut down. Let me back up. So many times when life is facing, when we're facing hardships, I shut down. I give up. It can feel like uh, everything is just coming to an end. In this story, Joseph is, is more than just emotionally invested in this marriage. In fact, engagements, though they're broken on and off in our time, in this time were legally binding. A betrothal was legally binding. It lasted a year, and it meant that the bride and groom were legally and financially pledged to each other, even though they had not yet consummated their marriage. They actually referred to themselves as wife and husband in this time. Their relationship was established between both families, as well as two legal witnesses, and they would come with this idea of this is what we're going to get out of the relationship and here's the finances that we're going to invest into it. And it was so legally binding that if you were even caught flirting, by the way, with someone else or making an advancement on somebody else during this period, considered adulterous. And in Deuteronomy 22, 23 through 27, it literally says, if a man happens to meet a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, they're both supposed to be stoned to death. That there's this, this sense that they're to be punished because he has violated another man's wife. Betrothals were a legally binding thing. But they were also uh, something that was practiced in Roman culture at the time. And it was legally binding and consent was needed. Uh, but it wasn't near as significant as what Joseph would have been invested in. Joseph's future now depends on this relationship that he has with Mary. He was legally, financially invested. His social status was invested in this wedding. And at this point, everything Joseph is, his father, his social money, his name, is invested in this marriage. If this falls apart, it ruins both of them. He had expectations, I'm sure, that someday they were going to be able to move down to the Sea of Galilee and get a nice house by the sea. They'd have some kids running in the yard with a white picket. You know, maybe they'd get a boat so he'd go out on the weekends away from the kids. And all that seems to be going now that Mary is pregnant. Was a carpenter. As I think my microphone begins to battery problems here. Joseph's a carpenter. He has a livelihood ahead of him. And all of a sudden, all of that seems challenged. Now, a a carpenter in this day is interesting as well because most likely Joseph wasn't building the wooden trains and planes and tables that we think of in a carpenter today. Rome was experiencing a lot of insurrection, especially from the Jewish people. And we find that there are tons of insurrections that happened in this time in just the town over. And carpenters, handyman of their day, were often enlisted to go back and rebuild towns after they had been destroyed. I just love the idea that Jesus chooses a father, an earthly father, who makes beautiful things out of ashes. That there's this sense of destruction that can be rebuilt. And as, as he hears this, Jacob, I mean, jo- Joseph is forced to wrestle with this. What is he going to do? His hopes for his future. And even of that, even though he's facing a total redefinition of who he is. He never loses a sense of honor. He doesn't break down a sense of honor. And though Joseph knew the scriptures, he models intentional discernment, right? There's this sense of intentional discernment that he takes place. The scriptures tell us something other than his honor. When we read through it, it says he considered these things. The word in Greek for considered implies intentional discernment. Discernment, this active sense of reflecting and pondering on. And when we see it in Acts 10, Peter is thinking or reflecting on his vision. When we see it in Jesus' words in Matthew 9, 4, Jesus says, why are you thinking these evil thoughts? Or why are you intending to act on these thoughts in which you are having? This word for consideration is a deliberate, intentional rumination of the thoughts that are going on in his head. 
And they are meant to bring about resolve. He is going into spiritual discernment, despite it feels like everything is coming unglued in this moment of discouragement, in the moment where he faces uh, what could be ruin. He's still seeking spiritual discernment. He's wrestling with God. I'm sure he becomes angry with God in some ways. And it would be really easy to go, nope, God's never acted this way in the past in the scriptures, so I'm just going to discredit it. Nope, this seems to go, I mean, God says it's a sin to not be married, so why would he ever come this way? Nope, he could have explained logically away what God was doing. And it would have been easy, too, because God was doing something that was completely unusual in their times. I think sometimes we miss how this is going to redefine Joseph's life. Joseph is probably about 18 at this time. Mary's probably about 14. Now, just think. We can say 14, 18, but in that day, that was normal for them. That's, that's common. 14 and 18 is still 14 and 18 emotionally. It is today. There was still a development that needed to happen. Though it was common in this era because they didn't live as long, the truth is they were still 14 and 18. The ability to even process what was happening would have been hard. What's interesting is they probably had never even been on a date alone. In this time, when a betrothal would have happened, it was through a matchmaker, usually somebody in the family, and the husband and wife-to-be would get together every time that they would see each other with both families involved. Could you imagine never sitting alone with the person in which you're about to marry, right? Never getting a heart-to-heart conversation because dad or mom are in the room at all times. That means when Mary breaks the news to Joseph and says, "Uh, yo, Joe, um, I'm pregnant. There's other people in the room. It would have been terribly hard to have that conversation. I'm sure that, by the way, she didn't only experience rejection of Joseph in that moment, but her own family. If he believes Mary, it has huge complications. He's considering it. He's wrestling with it. If he believes Mary, it's going to change everything for him. I want you to think about a time which you stepped out in faith. There's that sense of, I don't know what I'm about to get myself into. At 18, most of us begin to think about everything we have life. And all of that for him is about to change. We have big visions of where we want to be. We have hopes and dreams. And the step of faith that he's about to take will bring about financial and social consequence. Joseph doubts, I'm sure, that this is God's plan because most of us would doubt too. No, no, no. God would never do this to us. He blesses us. He wants the best for us. God wants me to prosper, we believe. No, I would say God wants us to come to the end of ourselves so that we follow him and not depend on ourselves. Joseph also in his story models, in this time of discouragement, life lived by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Gene, I'm going to have to let you click that. My clicker is uh, not working for me today. Joseph, like Mary, has this family lineage that connects him to David, the greatest of earthly kings. David was someone who walked intimately with God, and God revealed so much of David through song, through the prophets, right? Through dreams and visions. And I'm sure Joseph believed that God could speak any way he wanted, but I'm sure when he went to bed that night, he was not expecting God to show up. Mary just needed an angel to visit her. We looked at this last week. She's probably awake. It's probably daytime. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they have... Uh, of visitation. Zechariah has a visitation from an angel. We looked at the first week in broad daylight in the middle of uh, performing on the altar of incense. But in this story, Joseph is not only asleep and has a vision, but an angel visits him in that dream. Why does he have two, a double whammy? That's what I thought when I read this. And this is what I think. So often when we're facing discouragement and we can't tell where God is leading us, where we're feeling discouraged about our own conditions and it feels like God is just asking more of us, we lose ourselves in our own thoughts, don't we? We begin to overthink everything. In this story, I'm sure Joseph is overthinking everything. The only way that God is going to be able to get to him is when his brain is finally shut off 
when he's finally laying down. And it's there where he experiences a vision and he's experiencing an angel visitation. I think God still speaks this way today. I, I haven't had any experiences with angels, but I do believe that for each of us, God speaks to us in different ways. This isn't the only time that Joseph has a vision or a dream. In fact, in just a little bit after Jesus is born, Joseph is going to have a dream again. Matthew tells us an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph once again in a dream. The angel told him, get up, take the child and its mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I call for you, for Herod is going to search for the kid to kill him. Perhaps dreams was a way that Joseph had spoken to, uh, God had spoken to Joseph before, perhaps not. But I'm sure that he was beginning to trust this method of communication. Each of us hear from God in different ways. Some of us hear it as we swore the scriptures, others in times of reflection. Some of us might even experience dreams. Some of us experience it in prayer. But I encourage you to think how God has talked to you in the past, in the moments where you're feeling discouraged, and look for him to speak in the same way there. We start to see something unique about Joseph. There's a leading of the Holy Spirit. Up to this point, the Holy Spirit has been with special people uh, at special times and special cases. And though they knew there was this outpouring of the Holy Spirit for all coming, in this moment, all they could see was that the Holy Spirit was at special times. But Joseph, he experiences dreams, the leading of the Holy Spirit. We begin to get a glimpse of what life looks like in the Holy Spirit. And though Joseph counted the cost, he models faithful, immediate obedience. In this passage, it seems that the moment that Joseph gets up, he marries Mary. There's no seven-day wedding celebration that follows. It is an act of immediacy. In the moments in where we're often wrestling through discouragement, the reality is we are slow to act, slow to step out in faith. Joseph gets up from the dream. He marries Mary with this sense of immediacy being communicated in Matthew's telling. If we know that God, if we know what God is doing, we cannot delay. He's calling for us to follow. I think, lastly, Joseph also models that in this, disturbed, in this sense of discouragement he's facing, God can bring new life and new meaning to the scriptures. As he looks back, he looks at this passage, and Matthew highlights it for us, this, this promise from Isaiah, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God for us. Up to this point, Joseph had no idea what that passage meant. He knew the prophet Isaiah. In fact, in synagogues in their time, Isaiah would have been a scroll at the top of their gatherings. It would have been a thing that they read more than anything else. But they translated that passage not to be as messianic as it is. They translated it as a young girl rather than a virgin. Joseph did not see this passage as he was looking forward at one time as connected to a messianic passage. Here and now, in the middle of seeing what God was up to, he looks back and sees new life in the scriptures. As we sit in discouragement, it is essential that we continually look to the scriptures for new life. Joseph models what it means to embrace the unknown with faith, to find obedience in the midst of uncertainty, to trust God's timing, to take faithful small steps, but ultimately to choose joy. In a minute, we're going to close out with a song. But I want to highlight just one thing before we close. There's a huge difference between joy and happiness. Though we often break that down in a way that's not fair. The word for joy and emotion in the scriptures are related a lot of times, meaning they are not different. We often separate this is what happiness is, it's an emotion. But in the Bible, the word joy is an emotion as well. Joy, though, takes a different step. For the follower of Jesus, like it was for Joseph, it is rooted in the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that grows in us as our dependency in the times of discouragement grows. For the follower of Jesus, joy is defined by our relationship with the Spirit of God. Joseph's journey was not without challenges, yet he found a sense of joy that will sustain him of being part of God's plan. 
Joseph was rooted in a sense of sustaining joy that was not dependent on favorable circumstances, but was rooted in the assurance of God's presence and purpose. And on certainly in those moments of discouragement that we might be carrying, we have the ability to choose joy by considering in the struggle, focusing on God's promises and trusting in God's faithfulness. I'm sure as Joseph saw what lie before him, though he knew not what was yet to come and the uncertainties it meant, he held on to that sense that he knew from the Proverbs, the trust in the Lord with all of your heart, to lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submitting to him, and he will make your paths straight. Joseph models what it means to have a sense of joy in our discouragement, a sense of joy that will sustain us even when the future seems bleak. I believe we have a closing song that is a video. Am I correct? Okay. And so, Gene, I'll let you play that as I pray. So, Lord, we just give you our time as we leave. Go, let us go, Lord, with a sense of awareness of what you are doing. May we model honor. May we model still upholding spiritual disciplines and trusting you in the midst, Lord, even in the midst of discouragement. And may we find that why, that joy that sustains us as your spirit leads us, even as the future is unknown. We thank you, Lord. Amen.